patients uh, with a diagnosis of AML that are undergoing induction chemotherapy or patients that uh, undergo stem cell transplant during their period of neutropenia up until they engraft their counts. Uh, in general, the antibiotic prophylaxis is recommended for high-risk patients. For low-risk patients, uh, the recommendations are not prophylax. And again, I will show you um, those patients at risk for febrile neutropenia. So just some uh, main definitions that you need to be aware of. Uh, first of all, febrile neutropenia is defined uh, as a single oral temperature of uh, 101 times 1, or you have an oral temperature of uh, equal or more than 100.4, which sustains over an hour. So this is also the parameter that the nurse is using on the floor, and that's what you will be called about. Uh, and the neutropenia in general is defined as an ANC count less than 1,000. Profound neutropenia is defined as an ANC of less than uh, 100, and severe neutropenia is defined as ANC less than 500. So I'll also make a note that uh, there is some institutional variability of what is uh, uh, accepted as a neutropenia, uh, specifically for prophylaxis. So for example, if you go to Moffitt, um, I'll give you an example that for uh, heme malignancy patients, we generally start prophylaxis when they're ANC less than 500. So when they meet this criteria for severe neutropenia. Uh, and uh, on the BMT floors, we actually use a cutoff over 1,000. And again, there are some institutional variabilities that, uh, especially when we start working, you need to be familiar. Um, uh, what is the institutional protocol for the initiation of prophylaxis? So during my half of the lecture, um, we will go over this one patient case just to kind of um, guide you point by point. So you have a 50-year-old male uh, with prior history of diabetes, hypertension, who is transferred from the outside hospital with a newly diagnosed AML. So this is a relatively standard console that you will see at Moffitt. So either patients, uh, patient gets directly admitted uh, for the initiation of induction chemotherapy, or patient is admitted from the clinic, or patient is transferred from the outside hospital. So here you go, you, you got this console, uh, and uh, they are generally asking you to give them two recommendations. They want you to perform an assessment uh, for uh, risk of infectious complications, right? So they're asking you to give you to give them prophylactic recommendations uh, for the period of neutropenia, number one. And they also uh, want you to give them uh, empiric therapy regimen if this patient um, develops neutropenic fever. So you go see this patient, you, you see that the vital signs are stable. He has a right arm pick in place. Um, otherwise, exam is benign. Um, you look at the labs, patient has neutropenia with the ANC of 240. So this patient has severe neutropenia. Uh, otherwise, he has pancytopenic. And you notice that uh, he has normal renal and liver function. Uh, the primary team finalizes uh, treatment regimen. And you know that this patient is going to be initiated on 7 plus 3 induction chemotherapy. Uh, and uh, if you are a brand new fellow, you probably go on a Google and Google it and see that this is actually the chemotherapy, uh, which is uh, frequently used for induction of patients with AML, which is extremely mucotoxic and associated with high risk for infectious complications. So when you go in to see the patient or when you are about to review the patient's chart, even though you're an IT doctor, uh, when you evaluate patient with an oncologic malignancies, it is very important to know, number one, 
what is the underlying oncologic diagnosis? Because even by know that, it will give you an idea what um, potential infectious complications patient might encounter um, down the road. For example, if you have a patient with a multiple myeloma, uh, we know that those patients are at high risk for HSV, VZV, but not at risk of uh, PCP unless they receive a CAR T or high dose of steroids for extended period of time. Uh, another example, patients with uh, ALL uh, are not the same as patients with AML because we know that ALL patients, based on their immunologic defects, are at risk for PGP just at baseline comparing to patients uh, with AML that generally do not get uh, PGP unless they go for transplant mm -hmm. or high dose of steroids for a long time or go through the CAR-T treatment. So that's first. You, you do want to know what's their underlying diagnosis. You do want to know what's their chemotherapy regimen or a conditioning regimen for a transplant that they're going to get. Because again, by having this basic information, uh, you can anticipate the side effects, um, such as if I have a patient who is undergoing autologous stem cell transplant who is going to receive a high dose malfalan for conditioning. I'm anticipating that this patient will have a high volume diarrhea that um, if I test ABC for infectious etiologies, if it's all negative, I know that that diarrhea or colitis is probably related to chemotherapy and not infectious in etiologies and so forth. So again, I want to know the chemotherapy chosen um, because that would give me an information for the anticipated duration of neutropenia. Um, also, I would like to know if the chemotherapy regimen chosen would put that patient for uh, high risk for uh, chemotherapy-induced mucositis. Um, I look at the comorbidities very quickly. And again, why I need to know about this is uh, I will show you on the next slide that um, uh, it's uh, validated and known fact that patients that have chronic renal insufficiency, liver failure, uh, are at higher risk for infectious complications uh, during chemotherapy treatment. Um, I also would like to know what their home medications are um, because that will give me an information if uh, there are any possible drug-drug interactions with the medications that I will, would like to give to the patient. And one particular uh, drug interaction that um, we all need to be aware is generally QTC prolonging medication and use of an azole that, again, is very frequently used for antifungal prophylaxis uh, in the period of neutropenia. Uh, and then I look at the presence of indwelling catheters, such as central venous lines, um, Foley catheters, and there are some patients with CNS involvement that would have an Omaya reservoir. And again, it's important to make a note uh, in, for the future in case this patient develops uh, CNS side effects uh, or symptoms. Um, we would like to know if there is a prior history of multidrug resistant infections, such as um, specifically ESBL uh, or uh, CRE gram negative rod infections, uh, history of VRE infections, and MRSA. And specifically for MDR gram negative rods, we uh, generally try to get information from that outside hospital or look at our um, database at Moffitt to see if there were any positive cultures for MDRs. So, you know, we usually go five years back and see if there, there, there was anything concerning. And then uh, each patient who gets admitted uh, to the HIM floor or BMT floor gets screened uh, with VRE and MRSA swabs. And I'll tell you a little later what we do with that. So this is a graph uh, from uh, uh, the Journal of Clinical Oncology. Uh, and uh, these are the guideline recommendations from uh, ASCO and IDSA, essentially going over 
uh, the factors to consider in assessing risk for febrile neutropenia. And uh, I briefly went over it already, but essentially you look at the patient characteristics, underlying malignancy, and treatment malignancy um, uh, regimen. And uh, what I like about this table that you can see down, it does go over the regimens that are associated with high risk um, of um, infectious complications. And again, if you look in the mid portion where it says underlying malignancy, you will see the diagnosis that have the highest association with infectious complications. And right there on the very top, you see acute leukemia MDS. Um, so this is where your patient that we're discussing, uh, that's where he's fallen into within this table. I also included uh, this table that uh, does go over what I just mentioned recently, but it also includes risk factors for infections, specifically for stem cell transplant, patients uh, after stem cell transplant. And as you see on the right lower corner, so other things that you need to consider is a presence of um, um, immunomodulatory viruses such as CMV, a need for additional chemotherapy to control underlying disease post-transplant, uh, in the presence of graft versus host disease or active graft versus host disease. Um, so be aware of those uh, risk factors as well. On the next two slides, I included the table that specifically goes over the diagnosis and the treatment regimens chosen to treat the disease. And based on this, the authors give you uh, the infectious risks and uh, on the very right, you see the types of infections that this particular patients are at risk for. So on this slide, we see they go over AML, ALL, that most of these patients are at high risk for infection unless they get uh, less aggressive chemotherapy. And on this slide, you see um, the heme conditions uh, um, that um, mostly fall into the category of the medium infectious risk. Uh, those would be myeloma, uh, no, low-grade non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma, and again, just pay attention to the chemotherapy regimen chosen to treat this, uh, this uh, underlying heme malignancies. So going back to our patient, um, as I told you, this patient was diagnosed with, a di uh, diagnosed with acute myelogenous leukemia, and uh, the plan is to undergo induction chemotherapy with 7 plus 3. Based on the information which is available in the literature, we know that uh, for this particular patient, so AML and MDS, uh, A, baseline neutropenia is very common. So a lot of these patients, they already come in with underlying neutropenia. On the top of it, this patient is going to uh, get an intensive induction chemotherapy with 7 plus 3 with uh, the median time to ANC recovery of 26 days. So we're anticipating this patient will be at your highest risk for infectious complications for at least a month. Um, and uh, there's also literature saying that the, um, the patients that receive less aggressive chemotherapy, even for AML. So those would be, we're talking about um, uh, HMA treatments such as decitabine, azacitidine. Based on the literature, uh, those regimens are associated uh, with low infection risks. So are the two specific uh, uh, drug classes that I would like to mention that, again, you specifically have to make a note and look for it, would be steroids. Um, steroids are frequently used as an adjunctive to chemotherapy regimens in heme malignancies, um, or if not in heme malignancies, the second category where you see there's a lot of use of it is a treatment of adverse reactions from immunotherapy. So again, even if you are a community ID doctor and uh, you see a patient who is receiving immunotherapy, again, look 
always look for uh, steroid use. And uh, by definition, a uh, high dose of steroid use is defined as a use of um, prednisone of 20 milligrams per day or an equivalent for over four weeks. So those patients uh, specifically are at risk for PGP um, and would require prophylaxis for that. Uh, the second point that I would like to add about steroids is that they commonly mask your common infectious sites, uh, signs of infection, such as fevers, abdominal pain, rigors. So if you encounter a patient who is receiving high dose of steroids, you might need to look for other signs. Uh, again, do a very good physical exam because that patient might not have a fever. And uh, I encourage you all to uh, read this uh, state-of-the-art review and CID, which was published in 2024 um, on opportunistic infections associated with glucocorticosteroids. This was an excellent review. Another drug class that I would like to mention, again, that you would need to make a note if your patient is receiving this, is a monoclonal uh, anti-CD20 antibodies such as uh, rituximab. Uh, so the patients that uh, are treated with uh, this particular uh, class of medications uh, are at uh, high risk uh, for viral reactivations, and specifically the one that you need to screen the patients for and be aware is a hepatitis B reactivation. Uh, so again, any patient who receives rituximab have to be screened for hepatitis B, uh, C, and uh, uh, again, if uh, there is a positive uh, history or serologies, patients generally require uh, prophylaxis against hepatitis B. So moving next uh, to... Uh, the next portion of my lecture that covers antimicrobial prophylaxis in heme patients. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Where's that? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so let's talk briefly about antimicrobial prophylaxis in uh, heme malignancies. Uh, there are multiple resources available um, in the literature. You can look it up on UpToDate. Um, there are recommendations coming from ASCO and IDSA, as well as um, NCCN. Uh, so you can look at um, any of these resources. Just in general, I like to mention um, when you rotate through um, oncology floor or doing immunocompromised rotation, taking care of oncology patients, uh, your ID pharmacist might be your best resource uh, specifically to ask what are the complications or what is the expected duration of neutropenia with this particular regimen? Believe it or not, I do not memorize it. And this regimen's treatments, they change so often. It's, it's impossible to um, just at all. So I highly recommend that you go to your ID pharmacist and uh, ask, um, okay, what is the standard prophylaxis for this particular regimen? What are the things that we need to be aware of and things like that? And uh, when uh, uh, we are talking about antimicrobial prophylaxis and heme malignancies in general, so there are four things that you would like to assess. Um, antibacterial prophylaxis, right? Antifungal prophylaxis. And then when, when we're talking about antifungal prophylaxis, you ask yourself two questions. What is the risk of um, uh, invasive candida infection, number one? Uh, and uh, the second one, what is the risk for invasive mold infection, right? So because the agents that you use are different, and when you're talking about prophylaxis against IFI, you're talking about using either anti-mold azole or mycofungin, things like that, high-dose mycofungin. Um, the third one would be antiviral prophylaxis, and uh, you uh, will consider prophylaxis against HSV, VZV, 
and the hepatitis B virus, as we uh, discussed a couple of slides ago. And then the fourth one, again, not all of your patients will require it, but think about PGP prophylaxis in certain patient population. If you're at Moffitt, uh, that's probably where you see the majority of your heme patients. I highly encourage you to go on the intranet and find our uh, heme prophylaxis guide. So that's where you find all of your regimens uh, and uh, what is the standard of care and uh, what particular prophylaxis uh, we use or the patient needs. So if you go to the intranet, then uh, you uh, go under our antimicrobial stewardship institutional guidance page. Uh, you scroll down, uh, you will see hematologic malignancy prophylaxis. And then uh, click on it and it will bring you down, uh, bring you to this full document um, going over uh, different uh, regimens. I wanted to include uh, this table from uh, NCCN guidelines. So this was 2023, but not much changed uh, in 2024. And uh, the reason I like this page, uh, it's in table, it's very concise and uh, goes over uh, less you necessary prophylaxis for patients that are at low risk, intermediate and uh, high risk. So you can review it on your own. So just a, a couple of um, take home points for this portion of my lecture. Again, when you evaluate the patient, um, with heme malignancy uh, about to start treatment. Uh, think about the depth and duration of neutropenia that the patient is going to encounter based on the treatment or conditioning regimens that is chosen. Um, think about um, uh, the association of uh, that particular chemo regimen uh, with um, um, mucositis, chemotherapy-induced mucositis, assess for the presence of the central lines. Also, don't forget to look at underlying um, other chronic conditions. And for patients with um, um, stem cell transplant, uh, also look for the presence of uh, active or acute GBHD and the presence of immunomodulating viruses such as CMV. So we're continuing to the patient case. Based on the prophylactic guidelines, this patient was started on ciprofloxacin, acyclovir, and mycofungin prophylaxis. So mycofungin is used in the beginning because there is a critical drug-drug interaction, um, which is associated with the use of 7 plus 3. So once this drug-drug uh, uh, interaction is clear, there's a plan to transition this patient from mycofungin to voriconazole. And uh, on hospital day 15, this patient develops a fever of 101.6 um, with tachycardia, otherwise he remains stable. So at that point, neutropenic fever protocol is initiated and uh, the following day you find out that the patient has E. coli bacteremia, suspected from GI translocation uh, in settings of pro profound neutropenia. Neutropenic fever is definitely an oncologic and ID emergency. So if you get one of those calls in the middle of the night, you do have to ask certain questions uh, to uh, figure out if you are dealing with high-risk patient versus a low-risk patient. And on this slide, um, I have uh, the table that goes over high-risk patients for serious complications during episodes of neutropenic fever. So again, remember, not, not all of the oncologic patients are the same. Uh, there will be a group of patients that, um, based on the risk assessment, would fall into the category of low risk. And some of those patients actually um, uh, might be able to be managed as an outpatient. And there are two uh, scores that are used uh, uh, in the oncology ward. The first one is called clinical index of stable febrile neutropenia. 
And the second one, which is probably more commonly used, is called MASK, which stands for Multinational Association for Supportive Care in Cancer Risk Index. So again, based on this uh, risk um, assessment indices, there will be a category of patients that might be uh, managed for febrile neutropenia as an outpatient. And uh, on this uh, slide, uh, I have an information from uh, one of the uh, research papers that goes over infectious complications in the patients with the AML. Uh, when they are treated with um, aggressive induction chemotherapy, such as 7 plus 3, versus when they are treated uh, with a palliative um, uh, regimens, such as hypomethylating agents, such as decitabine, as a citidine, as I was mentioning earlier. So as you can see here on your left side, you can see that the patients that are undergoing intensive chemotherapy are at significantly higher risk uh, for febrile neutropenia, bloodstream infections, pneumonias, IFIs, and so forth. And um, in the um, uh, left lower corner, uh, you see the spectrum of the pathogens that was isolated from the blood cultures. So you can see here quite negative staph. Um, enterococcus, streptomitis, along with gram-negative organisms. But um, I will also show you one slide before. Within the past a couple of decades, there have been definitely a shift from gram-negative uh, bacteremias into the gram-positive bacteremia um, uh, bucket. When we uh, see the patients with uh, heme malignancies undergoing aggressive chemotherapy, um, you will encounter some patients that have significant mucositis. So what's important to remember about the chemotherapy-induced mucositis is that it generates a lot of inflammation, and even by itself, uh, it can present as a febrile neutropenia. So imagine what you're seeing in the mouth or around the rectum. It potentially can spread all down the whole GI tract, uh, causing all of this, um, uh, in a way, cytokine release. Uh, and then the second point to remember that patients with uh, mucositis are um, uh, definitely at risk for uh, bacterial translocations in settings of uh, profound neutropenia. And here is just a, a nice uh, graph showing you exactly what's going on uh, during febrile mucositis and mucosal barrier damage. Um, and what's important to remember is that uh, once this damage occurs, and even after discontinuation of uh, the offending agent, it takes on the average two weeks or even longer to heal all of this. So this is, uh, you know, a long-standing process for those patients undergoing chemotherapy. And here is just um, the information with the uh, data that I was showing you. Um, essentially, if you look in the right lower corner, you see uh, the evidence uh, uh, showing that there have been a shift uh, into gram-positive organisms that we uh, see now on uh, um, uh, bloodstream infections in this particular patient population. And uh, uh, in the last portion of my lecture, um, we will briefly go over the initial management of febrile neutropenia um, in the high-risk patients. So, um, you decided on the prophylaxis, uh, but then next day you come in and um, you see that the patient um, uh, has a febrile neutropenia. So at that point, um, uh, it is um, our job or even the job of the physician who is taking care of that particular patient to um, uh, assess the patient properly with a um, good physical exam and uh, uh, determine what would be the appropriate regimen, um, antibiotic regimen for this particular patient? So the recommendations tell us that we start with an anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam agent. So those would be cefepime, piperacillin, tazobactam, 
uh, meropenem, if there is a history of um, uh, ESBL organisms. Uh, we do not recommend uh, in general to use uh, cefazidim or astrianam by itself due to two reasons. Number one, due to the risk of breakthrough infections, uh, resistance, and uh, the second reason is uh, uh, ceftazidim has very weak coverage for gram-positive organisms such as um, GI strep, and astrianum essentially has no coverage uh, for gram-positive organisms. So when you choose to go uh, to the route of using these two agents, you would have to combine it with vancomycin. And uh, I included this table from NCCI, uh, NCCN guidelines from 2023 that uh, briefly, very concisely, goes over your initial antibiotic therapy. And also, as you can see on the uh, right, uh, goes over um, antibiotic therapy uh, as well as a suggested diagnostic diagnostic uh, workup that uh, needs to happen based on the uh, site of infection or um, you know presumed site of infection. So, for example, um, if you have a patient with uh, abdominal pain, um, uh, concerns for colitis. Uh, you will expand your initial uh, regimen to include gram negatives, gram positives, as well as anaerobic coverage. Um, if you have a presence of the lung infiltrates, um, again, you will um, make an assessment to make sure you're not dealing with uh, something like invasive fungal infection. And that workup um, uh, generally includes um, uh, more advanced imaging, such as uh, CAT scan, uh, uh, plus minus bronchoscopy. So very important point that we do not add vancomycin uh, um, on the basis just of neutropenic fever. Uh, so these are the criteria uh, when uh, you do add um, vancomycin to your uh, antipsychotomolal regimen. So those would be your patient is MRSA colonized, your patient had history of MRSA infections in the past, uh, your patient is in shock, um, you have an evidence of pneumonia, but you do not have information uh, of a MRSA screen. You have positive blood cultures for gram-positive organisms while you're awaiting speciation and susceptibility. Uh, you suspect that the patient has um, a skin or soft tissue infection or catheter-associated infection. Or you have severe mucositis in the patients that you uh, choose to use cefazidim uh, or astrianum, and again, you would add vancomycin initially because those two agents have uh, very poor to no coverage for gram-positive organisms. So we used to use um, uh, VRE coverage um, uh, in the patients that um, are VRE colonized. We um, no longer do that. So. If you get admitted to the heme, BMT, CAR T floors, everybody gets a VRE screening. But this mostly done uh, for infection prevention purposes, for the purpose of isolation. Uh, we no longer um, do empiric VRE coverage for neutropenic fever patients because studies have shown that the addition of VRE coverage does not impact your mortality and outcomes in general. So two patient categories where you would still add VRE coverage would be the patients that are in shock or the patients that have evidence of gram-positive cocci in blood and VRE colonized while you're awaiting identification. So even that, in a way, now is um, eliminated by this rapid diagnostics, right? So if you know that the patient has GPCs um, in blood, in an hour and a half, you would have information, right, on if it's an enterococcus and uh, what is the um, information on van A and uh, van B. 
And here is actually one um, article that came from uh, Moffitt um, and was published by uh, Matt, Dean, Nina, our pharmacist, as well as Dr. Belush as a corresponding author. And uh, there is a uh, one particular bacteremia that I would like you to read up about, um, a very dense group strep bacteremia in patients uh, uh, that are profoundly neutropenic can be associated with prolonged fevers, hypoxia, even shock uh, due to um, this kind of cytokine release storm, which is caused by very dense group strep. So these patients, uh, again, have to be assessed uh, um, very carefully. And uh, there is a, uh, a subset of patients that do get extremely sick from this particular uh, bacteremia and might need steroids to, again, um, weaken uh, the immune response to uh, this particular bacteremia. And uh, just one more condition that I will mention that uh, you will encounter, especially um, during your Moffitt rotation, is a neutropenic enterocolitis. Um, so this is the entity that um, uh, specifically um, uh, is particular, again, for the patients that undergo um, induction or um, AML chemotherapy treatments uh, and uh, occurs during the periods of uh, uh, profound neutropenia. Uh, the clinical presentation is generally of one of tiflitis. Uh, however, some presentations could be um, very nonspecific. So that could be febrile neutropenia, abdominal distension, nausea, vomiting. Uh, the diagnosis is generally made by uh, the imaging. Um, the treatment is a bowel rest, um, a lot of times TPN, and the antibiotics that uh, include the coverage for gram-negative organisms, GI gram-positive flora, and anaerobes. Um, the duration of treatment is uh, very tricky in these patients. So if you look at the literature, there are no good studies uh, to guide you with the treatment duration. Um, some uh, recommendations uh, suggest you continue broad spectrum antibiotics until ANC recovery, which is one way to follow. However, in this era, we see a lot of patients that are neutropenic for weeks and months. And uh, of course, we cannot continue um, IV therapies for that long. So generally, um, uh, we use um, uh, our information from the exam as well as repeat imaging and essentially clinical response to see when we can uh, step down to the oral options and or whether the patient truly needs uh, aggressive antimicrobial therapy for an extended time. And uh, here, just take home points from my portion of the lecture. Again, do a careful assessment um, in the very beginning. Uh, you will definitely see uh, these patients, uh, no matter if you are in a, a university hospital or even community hospital, um, I advise you um, to get familiar with uh, institutional guidelines, specifically where you work uh, at, and work closely with your ID pharmacist. They're um, exceptional help with these patients. And I will uh, hand it over to Dr. Belush. Uh, so I thank you, Dr. Konkova. I might fly through my part, but again, you will get the slides, so it's all good. Uh, the rest of this is talking about the three buckets, auto transplants, so cells from yourself to yourself. So then allo, someone else's cells to you, and then CAR. Now CAR traditionally is your own cells for the most part, other than certain trials. And then there's a couple words about being in remission. The only one that you're the best remission is for the allo. You should theoretically be in remission for an auto, and you're definitely not in remission for a car. They're all flying high with lots of disease everywhere. And when we first started CAR T, it was so kind of crazy. We're used to because we saw the heme patients that have disease, but to watch these BMT attendings struggling with this concept that all of their patients actually had disease was kind of funny. 
So this just shows like it's just always on the up and up. There's more people needing allos, more people needing autos. So let me be clear, like you guys go into whatever flavor of ID work in the future, this is going to percolate into your practice. So you have to be comfortable with these types of patients is no longer um, kind of allowed to be like, oh, well, I don't know what an auto allo or car is. You're like, this is now considered the norm. So when someone says, I need an aloe, you should be able to think in your mind, like, okay, so what types of aloes are there? There are many different types. They have different problems that go with the different types. The best type is one that's related to your family. Why? Because in theory, it's a lower rate of graft versus host disease. But say all of China, they have one sip, right? So then because of China, then they create all this different data. First came the double cords out of China. Well, we killed like five out of five patients. So we stopped doing double cords at Moffitt because, you know, that's really a high mortality. We started looking into other alternatives. So now we do haploidentical. So that is a one degree family member. So still could go back to a parent, but has more mismatch potentials. But what it did is by using those types of donors, we brought in post-transplant cyclophosphamide. So all of a sudden we see lots more CRS, cytokine release syndrome, and other types of side effects, mainly for us being viral infections. This just shows why people like Olga and myself have jobs is because what's one of the biggest reasons people die? This is actually the better numbers. This is a match related. They still have within the 100 days, because when we look at transplant data, we're like 100 days past 100 days. You still have quite a bit of death related to infection. But this is the one that they really are concerned about, that if you're an unrelated donor within 100 days, it's actually a higher rate of death than for anything else. So truly, they, the BMT service, though, because of fact certification, we have to send and we use emails because we're Moffitt. We use emails to communicate with the primary team because they have to agree and then they have to implement in general, like 98% of our recommendations, other than like you need a stat Tobra, usually the attending is communicating with the other attending and we're putting in a stat order. But it's because of data like this that we have the ability to go toe to toe with the primary teams to be like, this is what needs to be done. Whoa. This is just talk about CAR-T. I was talking, I had a new DCE on Monday about what was CAR-T. I was actually surprised she didn't know anything about it because CAR-T is now already even on step one. It's that way it's percolated so far into the med school curriculum. Essentially, for lack of a better word, say if you have lymphoma, that was the original CAR-T. You have a tumor, you stab it, you send it off to the lab, they do some magic mojo. They make it into a bag that's anti-CD19. They send it back to you. You hang it with your specialty pharmacist and it goes in and it literally attacks a tumor load. So the different way to look at it is when I was in training, 100% of these patients went to hospice because it was the end of ICE R or R ICE, whichever way you were trained. And then now we took those 100% of hospice patients and 40% of them get durable remission for the lymphoma sector. So like, Olga wasn't with us yet, but I, I actually went through multiple cycles of unhappiness because I would be like, if this had come earlier, these patients would be alive longer. It just kept on going around and around. And I'm like, okay, Leah, get your shit together. Like, this is when it comes. This is when it's going to be FDA approved. And just, you got to move on with it. This is also why I'm not an oncologist and I'm an ID doctor. But it was very fascinating and scary at the same time to be like, what is CRS? We have patients with fevers to 105. Um, our patient, Michael Rowe, may he rest in peace, he had a seizure. We learned the hard way why you have to use Keppra with these patients when because of the risk of seizures and all the other untoward effects. So literally, we saw it come down the pipeline because we were one of the main centers for car team. This is just another way of how they talk about taking the T cell, how they make the car T cell, and then how they put it in. Words that you might hear floating around that they went for collection. This is usually outpatient before they have come to us. But sometimes in tumor board, which I would definitely recommend you guys to listen because you get to hear it from the inside group about what they're doing, what they're concerned for, why they talk about a buffy layer. You're like, oh, so you need a certain amount of this type of white cell for this to even work. 
this is what I finally call about playing in their sandbox because if I understand their vocabulary better, then I can make interventions that make sense to them and then help our patients in the end of the day. They do the modification, multiplication, amplification, sometimes another word, the chemotherapy, because the DRG for CAR is about $1 million. So the way it works, if they more stuff done outpatient, the more money they get to keep in their back pocket, right? So they do the chemo all outpatient. We traditionally don't see them then, except there is a type of multiple myeloma card that Dr. Kunkova and I get to see in clinic because the goal is to keep them all outpatient until they have a fever. Some of the cars then get admitted on rest day, which is right before day zero, and then they infuse the product and you wait for the magic to happen. Now, some of them, as we like to say, especially for lymphoma, mantle cell, the relatively solid issues, the higher the tumor board, tumor board, tumor burden, the higher rate of fever. And so they're the ones that will often with the first fever will get dex, will get tocilubumab, will get the whole shebang because they're the ones at the highest rate of just dying right away from CRS. Or like uh, we had a recent one that had a gastric tumor related to mantle cells. So we were all over the chart, high risk for perforation because, you know, Piptazo does a great job, but it doesn't heal a hole. And so I had to have that conversation a few times. They're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, you perforate that patient? I don't have anything for you. I will happily give you more antibodies. But it literally, if it's transmural, your patient's still going to die. And you can just see the shock on their face. I'm like, I, I'm not talking rocket science here. But this is where I had the blessing to have had previous patients with PTLD when I was up in Canada, that when we melted the PTLD, we actually did not realize it was transmural and the patient perforated and then died, sadly. Then you have the infusion and you have recovery. So like for aloes, they hang out locally up to 100 days. Uh, these um, CAR T's are not quite as long, but it depends on the number of side effects or neurotoxicity we'll get into in a moment, all the other foo that can occur. When people are throwing different names around, I thought it would be wise to have it put together in one spot because even for me, heaven forbid, this is one of the times I'm like, give me a brand name because I can't say these generic names worth my life. So brand name, away it goes. So again, why is this important to us? Because these things, it's very blurry. We don't know all off the bat, like what is CRS? What is gonna be infectious? One of the saddest, funniest phone calls I've had from Dr. Lazarian was, I wasn't even on call because I was at the mall. I was definitely not on call. And he was like, hey, Ellie. I'm like, hi, Alex. He's like, I have a patient with severe CRS. I'm like, okay. And he's like, we're on four pressures. I'm like, well, man, like, no, I'm not the person you need. <laughs> and he's like, what antibiotics can I give? I'm like, let's go back to your opening comment. The patient has severe CRS. Your patient's still going to die. I'm like, you're more than welcome to be here. Some meropenem. Here's a dose of Tobra. I'm like, your patient's going to die. And can you please explain that to the family? The patient died, obviously. Well, I mean, that's severe CRS. People still die from severe CRS, but it can mimic infection. And then I'll tie this in the Dr. Konkova as a sepsis champion, you have to be very careful with your documentation and say, we think this is CRS much more than sepsis. It just mimics the pathology, culture negative, um, broad spectrum antibiotics, and unfortunately that's the way that goes. Neurotoxicity, very scary stuff for us because I mean, we're not neurologists, but when the patient is totally off the count, they can't, all of a sudden they'll go from being able to talk to being like they have a stroke to not being able to count their numbers. And heaven forbid, they start saying, count backwards from 100. I can't even do that. I'm generation calculator. I'm like, these questions only work for a certain generation of people. I'd be like, just give me an F now. So, but with CRS, you know, we do work up, up. You know, you do your blood cultures, you start your empiric antibiotics, you'll see every day these patients are getting CRPs and ferritins. TOSI, $5,000 a pop. Okay, it's a lot of money, but they you get up to two doses, but if it's not working, they go to the next dangerous drug, which is anakinra, even more expensive. You're just destroying the immune system, but this is they're trying to quiet down. Forget the fact they're pummeling them with more decks I've ever seen used in a service before. So it's just a lot. You just take a deep breath. 
document what they're using so you can explain that to the attending because we want to look at the patient holistically. What's the net state of immunosuppression? What's the pretest probability? Are we going to have a fever? Okay, if they're still banging out a fever, despite all these drugs, you got a bigger problem. You know, being able to explain it to patients, families, forget the patient. They're usually kind of comatose by this point. So you just have to work quickly. If you see, you read a no and they say, alert and orient to terms three, and the patient is like this, you have to also notify the primary team because they might not know that all of a sudden the patient is acutely decompensating and they need to maybe go back on the steroids. So communication is always key. Neurotoxicity kind of talked about the encephalopathy, a lot of workup. They consult neuro. They do the whole slew of imaging, a lot of EEGs. Some of our patients are getting literally EEGs every day. A kinetic seizures is a real thing. It's not just from cefepime. So this is just a paper to about the infections and CAR T. The, still one of the biggest reasons people die is from very random infections in CAR T, especially in the beginning. It was like this candidemia, this other issue. And they're like, what do we need to do differently? I'm like, nothing. Because like it's too random. I cannot change prophylaxis for random events. I really like this slide. This was the last time Marty gave a lecture at a presentation before he passed away. He was one of the best transplant ID doctors in the nation, and his hobby was photography. And he was literally on the side of a waterfall, slipped to film, and died. So, yes, such a shame. I mean, it also just reminds you that we are still human, and you have to be careful about your life outside of medicine. But this is a great way of just showing kind of the buckets when you think about like Dr. Konkova reference when you work up a heme patient. These are types of questions you think of when you work up an allo patient. You know, all these other questions. What have you been exposed to? I love, where's Dr. Tony when I want to call him out? So Dr. Tony has his hip Gia and I'm like, what the hell did you just say, JT? And he's like, had it before and got it again. And I can tell you, like, my patients know hip Gia because I'm a what you get? And they're like, why are you asking me so many nosy questions? I'm like, A, I'm an ID doctor, and B, because it's important, you know, so it really is. Then we ask questions about the type of transplant because they have different rates of infection. And then the different tools that we have and, you know. Wherever you go, wherever you end up in practice, you have to go talk to your micro lab. How often do you do CMV? How often do you do EBV? Last night, I was sending random messages to our micro lab, like on my way home. So at MMH, what happens if I put your XYZ test? And they're like, no. Well, what do you mean no? No, we have to call the courier to pick it up from Magnolia, then take it to MMH, and then you can have the nurse pull it. I'm like, okay, as long as I know how long it takes extra. <laughs> So that wasn't a problem. This is a fantastic, I'll bet slightly old document picture. This is from 2009, the IDSA guidelines for neutropenic fever. Everybody should have this one downloaded and looked at because it's golden. And, you know, it's still the same. You give chemo 15 to 45 days later is when usually your mucositis starts to improve. But like it talks about at the top, you have your, in theory, cursor, where'd you go? Neutropenia, the barrier breakdown, you have translocations from stuff in your mouth. There is a gap. Why? Because it requires a certain duration of neutropenia before aspergillus starts to be an issue. But imagine your patient is one of Dr. Konkova's MDS patients who is neutropenic coming in. That's why there's a C3 indication that if you come in to transplant neutropenic, this part shifts over to the left and we'll ask for triazole as soon as it's safe also known as day plus five, because you need to get your PTSI out of your system. This is a graphic that's just nice to remind you of uh, um, antifungal drugs. Where did they work? This is just another type of graphic, because I'm a picture person, that for the interest of time, we'll just, you can see here, like, who is contraindicated prolonged QTC? Who is not prolonged with QTC? Who has hallucinations? But I recommend not using the word hallucination. I'm always like visual alterations. Why? Because the majority of the visual alterations is simply I took the tablet of void. 30 minutes later, I have a halo around the light. That's not a hallucination. That's a visual alteration. 
And I'm like, but then I tell them there's a small percentage they start seeing the geckos on the floor. They're like, okay. But the other thing is because of the drug drug interactions, I tell them like you can't just spontaneously stop the drug because then all of a sudden your immunosuppression level will drop precipitously. You need to call up the team, discuss. Is it a really warrant change? Does it not warrant change? The halo stuff actually tends to wear off and patients are fine. I personally do not put that type of issue as an allergy. I know some of my colleagues do, but you have to have a significant issue to then put it as an allergy. Even for people with photosensitivity, I'm going to be rude for a minute, but if you're dumb ass and go out in the sun with worry in your system that's just you being dumb that's not actually that's just a side effect of the drug so yeah transaminitis all these drugs go through the liver and fluoride accumulation we have had cases it's usually people that is more than three months on um for conazole. pipeline drugs so we do have some of them it is important because we use some of these drugs at Moffitt. we have had phosphomenogepix we've had ibrex use We've sent samples for a roller film. We, it was already resistant, so it's so far been useless for Moffitt patients. And resifungin, I refuse to allow it to come to PNT, so we don't have it. So. Specific reason, like cost? Also because it's a once a week, right? The niche is very narrow, too narrow for us. I see why. <laughs> Did you go to a drug rep dinner or something? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I see why you said no. Yes. So, but having been two weeks ago in the national stewardship um, meeting, they, you know, of course, MD Anderson is the one that they want everything. But even for them, they were like, they want it for the wrong reason, which is also MD Anderson standard. And I was just like, I don't know. I don't need every flavor of everything, which is what MB Anderson does. Like their formulary is god awful. I can't imagine what they do with their chemo as well. But no, I mean, if you don't think it's gonna fit with your patients, then why bring it? So we is no different than I single-handedly procrastinated for all of Moffitt to delay the bringing on of the Tibermere for CMV prophylaxis, because initially we didn't have a problem until they changed the chemotherapy modalities, and then we had a CMV problem, and then we brought lutetomy. This is just a reminder for pneumocystis prophylaxis, because most of our regimens are fludarabine-based, so you buy yourself minimum six months of cystis issues. That Before you use Dapsone, what lab do you have to order? Jesus. Perfect. And then before you use Intel Pentam, what do you have to make sure the patient doesn't have? Sespa. Ahua, what? What would the answer? Sespa allergy. No, and no. For, asthma. Yeah, no asthma, no bronchospasms. And so I even will go as far to say if you have COPD and your lungs are kind of jacked, if your DLCO is really low, that this is not appropriate for you to use. We have literally iatrogenically killed per people with this, okay? This was the scenario. He was a dentist, he was non-compliant. He was not gonna have a durable life anyways, but this is what was really sad. He got a nosocomial flu, he survived the flu. I was like, great. And then he was in the hospital for 28 days. So they're like, we need to start pneumocystis. I'm like, okay, they're like, we want phantom. I'm like, not a good idea. Like, this is really bad. And the BMT fellow's like, no, no, I know I'm what I'm doing. I'm like, no, you don't, you really shouldn't. He did, so the, this is how bad it went. He had the drug, within an hour he started coughing and then he vomited, he aspirated and he died. That wasn't the worst part. The worst part was we got dinged with a nosocomial flu related death. And I was like, wait, but he didn't actually die from the flu. They're like, nope, same admission, doesn't matter. So I was like, oh, okay. So inhale Pentan, be very careful. So this, we'll just fly through this. I'm a graphics person, as in I'm, I like images. This is just 
With a triangle, the most use is at the bottom, so we use a cycle here like it's in the water. We love 800 BID. That's a good dose. Most people tolerate it. If you go up, this is cost going up and nephrotoxicity going up. So if you're going to use gang cycle products, technically you could use it for HSV. More often, we're using it for CMV or for HHV6. If you go up, foscarinid then, much more nephrotoxic. HSV, if you think it's a cyclic resistant, the thymidine kinase issues. If you have CMV issues, especially if they haven't engrafted yet. So because the idea of being the bone marrow is fragile, so you don't want to use gang cyclic, so we're going to pop on those beans. That's, you only got two options, pop on bone marrow, pop on beans. And then cytofavir, we still do use, we have actually a number of different cytofavir kind of like protocols. There's a low dose one for um, adenovirus that works very well, a low dose one for BK as well. I honestly, don't use it for CMV because that's a horrible dose. I love this graphic. I stole it. it I fully acknowledge in the board review. But what's nice about this is just shows that your three different immunosuppressed traditional categories, BMT, solid organ transplant, and HIV, that these issues are not the same, right? They present differently, and that type of nuance is what allows Dr. Kunkova and I to shine in our field of immunosuppressed ID. A few words about CMV prophylaxis, we'll fly by this. It's just this, that essentially now all highly immunosuppressed aloes, they, um, are CMV positive, get latubimir from day eight to day 100. A couple words about stewardship. I was just explaining to my DCE student, thinking about what's the best drug dose interval for your particular patient, for the particular disease that they have. It allows us to, you know, give the best opportunities are we able to de-escalate? Are we able to narrow therapy based on the micro? And the key thing is it does not necessarily, it's not supposed to increase your rates of sepsis. We do not have increased death related to infections. And to date, we have not had, we, it actually helps us keep our resistance rates down if you're doing it appropriately. Diagnostics, this is just wherever you go. The diagnostics here at the VA is not the same as the diagnostics at the Moffitt versus TGH. So like you have to be cognizant of these nuances. If you're like me, I use my I use my phone address book actually to contact to be like these are the nuances at this hospital, this hospital, this hospital. So it's important to know, for example, blood cultures are held for five days. You know, how often do you get your CMV PCRs done? Where, you know, what's your reference lab for Moffitt? It's ARUP, it goes all the way to Salt Lake City on average is a four day tournament. Other diagnostics, so you'll see a lot. Do you guys have the microbial cell free DNA here? At no. Is that peculiar chappy still in charge of the micropathic? Uh, the one who approves the tobacco? There. It's it's complicated, but um it's complicated. <laughs> no no nothing has changed in our leadership, but uh well, yeah, it's complicated when we don't have well no, it was the first time I saw a physician chewing tobacco in his office and I was like <laughs> I was a bit in shock. You know, we make fun at Moffitt that there are providers at Moffitt who smoke. I mean, we're like, we're cancer. So. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. But no, so the microbial cell free DNA, it's a bit of a point of contention for getting it to a facility. Fully acknowledged, it took me seven tries to get it at Moffitt. So it was not small potatoes. And then I had to, what was able to get that final push is that now at CLSI certify. But you still have to have a ha, pretty a good question for the test. It's no different than any other test. Like, what's your pretest probability? Like, you can't do shotgun medicine because that gets you in a bit of a bind. Because then you have to explain why you don't treat X, Y, Z that you found in the result. So the, this was just an example because our patient was essentially going into the FUO sector. So we did a sample and always results on a Friday and it came back with toxoplasmosis. And so toxoplasmosis in our field is kind of 
underdiagnosed because the old school technology is autopsy. Well, if you're catching it on autopsy, you're like way past that point in no return. And then, you know, we started doing PCR, but that's still five days. We've had cases that it's come back positive also while well, they're already dead because they died two days prior. I'm like, well, that's also really late. And so this is now kind of a new opportunity to kind of get, catch certain things earlier. What's that turnaround? 30 hours. It has to just ship to California and it comes to our phone in real time. So this is just to remind you, cancer care is definitely multidisciplinary. There's many different aspects. Sometimes you, you know, someone's short of breath, you do a new CT and you're like, why are there lines in this linear formation? We have to reach out to radonc and they're like, oh yeah, that's just radiation from itis that's evolving. Or we had a recent case um, that we'll talk about in tumor board that patient has a history of pembroke related itis, so like gastroenteritis and one other itis, and he came with acute shortness of breath. And they were like, well, he just had an auto. And so I just politely walked over and talked to the medical pharmacist. I was like, so his last pembro was this date. Could this be pembro related pneumonitis? They're like, oh, without a doubt. So we kept on trying to explain that to them. And the APPs have never seen pembro related pneumonitis. The attending is a multiple myeloma attending, had never seen it. So the patient got discharged with oxygen. And so I politely just sent an email to the clinic doctor, this is a lymphoma expert. I'm like, yeah, you know, I spoke to these pharmacists and they definitely say this is consistent with pneumonitis from Pembro. The images are consistent because I happily sent, you know, Google shots to the APP and she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh, that's not the right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, you know, the outpatient attending then started the steroids because I'm like, this poor kid's gonna be like right back into the service if they don't give some steroids. So definitely multidisciplinary. This is just a beautiful picture of the team. You'll just remember at Moffitt, we're a relatively large team, lots of different doctors, lots of different pharmacists, the micro lab, we have infection prevention, a lot of staffing in clinic. So all of us work together. Like we try to remind everybody, we are also the oftentimes the first people people are gonna ask about infection prevention changes. Now we do candida oris screening. Now we do iodine up the nose. All sorts of other fun stuff. And I think that is it. Thank you.